We're going to start off this lesson by diving in and looking at some HTML code and then breaking it down. If you're a complete beginner, this probably looks a lot like a foreign language. But don't worry, because it is. And just like how you learned English, you'll be able to learn this new language in time. So let's examine this code. These are all HTML tags. You may often hear words HTML element or HTML tag used interchangeably. There's a subtle difference between the two that we won't go into now, but just know that you're okay to use them interchangeably in conversation. You may notice that each set of HTML tags has an opening tag as well as a closing tag. This is so that you can place more elements or text in between the tags. This is sort of like a Russian nested doll or like the layers of an onion with each layer inside getting smaller until you reach the last one. And each closing tag looks like the opening tag except for the forward slash in the closing tag. And some HTML elements only have one tag, like a tag used to display images. And this is because certain elements like the image tag don't ever nest other items inside them, so there's no need for a closing tag. Since again, the second tag is used just to wrap the nested content with inside it. Now, while we have this code up, I want to point out a few particular tags. The first one is the HTML tag. Now, while HTML often refers to any tag that you might find on a web page, there happens to be a particular HTML tag that uses the letters HTML. And this tag is one of the first elements you'll find on any web page. So you would place your set of HTML tags on your page, and then you would nest all your other tags inside of those. It's sort of the base element on the page. And usually just inside of the HTML tags, we have two common sets of tags you'll find. First is the head set of tags, and then the second is the body tags. The head tags contain information that our web page needs, such as references to other files that we might want to use or import to our web page, or also maybe a title for our page that would show up in the browser tab. And the body tags are tags that wrap all the other elements in our web page. Now let's take a look at the div tag. And this would be a case of a tag that would be inside the body tag. The div may be the most commonly used tag in websites. Div is essentially short for division because it divides or separates elements on a web page. And just like the way you might separate things in a closet with boxes, a div tag separates elements. And similar to the way that you might put a label on a box, you can also name HTML elements like the div tag by placing a class or ID within the tag. We won't go into IDs or classes right now. That's a little teaser for a future lesson. But for now, let's show an example of the div tag in action. I'll add two div tags next to each other. And then inside of each of these div tags, we're going to put a P tag. The P here stands for paragraph. And this P tag is generally used for organizing smaller groups of text, like a paragraph or a subtitle. In one P tag, I'm going to write my first name. And in the second paragraph, I'll write my last name. And if I were to save this file and simply drag it onto a web browser, I should see my name on the screen, David Ames. And now you know what HTML is and how to make a few HTML tags. Welcome back. In our second lesson here, we're going to go over some tags that relate to text and spacing, as well as the horizontal row tag. Let's start with header tags, also known as H tags. These are header tags, and there are six of them h1 through h6. Let's put some text inside them and see what happens. You'll notice that the h1 tag has the largest text and the h6 element has the smallest text. These tags basically increase or decrease the font size of your text. Now onto the i tag and the b tag. If you wrap your text in the i tag, you'll make it italic or wrap it in the b tag and your text will become bold. Lastly, we'll look at the hr tag also known as a horizontal row tag. This tag basically does what it says and gives you a thin horizontal line wherever you place it. And unlike most tags, you don't need to close the HR tag since you can't put anything inside it. Let's now summarize what we just went over. We went over H tags, uh, one through six, which can make text larger or smaller. I tags, which can italicize text, B tags, which can be used to bolden text, 
and the HR element, which creates a thin horizontal line where we place it on the page. Have fun using the stuff you just learned in the code games and projects, and I will catch you in the next lesson. Bye for now. Hi, you've made it to lesson three, congratulations. In this lesson, we're gonna go over links, um, and let's get started. And so the link tag is uh, called an anchor tag, and it looks like this. Most every time that you've clicked on a link in a website that takes you to another page within the website or to some other website, you've clicked on an anchor element. And now you're about to be introduced to a new part of an HTML tag called an attribute. Now attributes go inside tags, that is in between the anchor brackets that make up a tag. And if you're working with a pair of tags like the div or most other elements, it'll go in the first set of tags. Now, attributes are placed in between the element name and the closing angle bracket, uh, separated by at least one space on each side. There are many kinds of attributes that can go inside of an HTML tag that do all sorts of different things. But for now, we're just going to learn about the main attribute you'll find inside of an anchor tag, and that is the href attribute. That's href. And the href attribute contains the URL where uh, the link goes to. So there are two main ways of using a link on a web page. The first is linking to another website. Notice the HTTP colon forward slash forward slash. Without that HTTP colon, the browser would look for a path on your current site. But if we add the HTTP colon, then the browser knows to look for a page uh, on a different website. You may have noticed that sometimes when you're browsing, there will be a little S after the end of the HTTP, like this. The S stands for secure, and it's appended to website URLs that have taken some extra steps to secure their website data. For example, if you go to pretty much any bank website, you'll see that S at the end of the HTTP in the URL bar. Now back to links. The other main way which we can use links is to direct users to another page within our current site or the current site that they're on. And we can do that by using a forward slash followed by the path to the page within our site that we want to show. So in this case, we'll leave off that HTTP colon and we'll just put a forward slash. For example, forward slash contact might link a user to the contact page within our site. To add an href attribute to an anchor tag, all you have to do is type href, href, then an equal sign um, with no spaces, followed by quotations without any spaces again. And then inside of the quotations, you'll type the URL that you want to use. And now that we have our links URL set up inside of our anchor tag, we'll want to add something for the user to click on to take them to that URL. So inside the anchor tag, we can add text or an image that the user can click on. Hi, in this lesson, we're going to learn about the image tag. If we want to display images on a web page, we use the image tag. Similar to the anchor tag, the image tag can also take many different attributes. But for now, the main one we're concerned with is the source attribute. That's SRC. The source attribute refers to the path that points to the location of our image file. This can be a local file path that points to the folder where we're keeping our images for our website. Or this can also be a URL that points to a different website that may host our images, like Flickr or Google Photos. To type in a URL for the source attribute, we'll follow the same convention as we did for the anchor tag's href attribute. We'll type, in this case, src, and an equal sign, then quotation marks, and inside of those quotation marks, we'll type the either local file path to our image or a website URL that points to our image. And that's how you add an image to an HTML page. Pretty simple. Welcome back and congratulations. You've made it to the final lesson in this HTML course. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the input tag. The input tag is most often used in forms. Forms can be used for login or registration or on a contact page, just to name a few things. And in the upcoming JavaScript course, we're going to be covering forms more in depth. But for now, let's get more acquainted with some of the pieces of a form. With the input tag, we can get pretty much any type of user input that we would need for most any form. 
such as passwords or files through a file picker, or selections through radio buttons, or simply text through text field. And to change the type of an input, we can add a type attribute, actually called type, T-Y-P-E, and we add that to the tag, and we give that attribute the value of the input type we want to use. For example, if we want to generate a password field input, then we would write type, equal sign, quotation marks, and inside of the quotation marks, we would write password. And if we want a checkbox, then we would change the type to checkbox. And this is the same for file inputs or email inputs or text inputs. All you have to do is change the type. And that's it for forms and for the HTML course. Hi, and welcome to the CSS course. I'm excited to begin this journey with you towards mastering the art of styling web pages. The only prerequisite to this course is a basic understanding of HTML. So without further ado, let's begin. CSS literally stands for Cascading Style Sheets. And in short, CSS is the programming language that we use to change the look of a web page. So to demonstrate what CSS can do, let's start by changing a font's color. For this example, we're going to use a p tag, and we'll put inside the p tag the text I got style. Let's first change the font color from black to red. To do that, we'll add a style attribute to the p tag, and in between the quotation marks, we'll write our style. The syntax for writing CSS styles is property, and then colon, and then your value, and then a semicolon. And we want to change the font color to red. So we first add the property of color then our colon, and then our value of red, and then we finish with a semicolon. Voila! Now we have red text. Now if we want to make this text bold, we can use the font weight property. We can set the font weight to bold if we want bold text, or normal if we want normal text. Or if we want more granular control, we can pass in one of nine values, 100 to 900. I'm not sure why, but we always need the two zeros at the end to make them even hundreds values. Earlier we changed our fonts color to red. Browsers support using primary color name values like red, blue, gray, yellow, etc. But if you want more variety of choices with the colors that you use, you can use a hex code. A hex code is a six character combination of letters and numbers that allows you to use pretty much any color that you want. So we're going to keep the text red, but we're going to find a more unique red that we want using a hex code. So I'll replace the word red with a pound sign. You always need a pound sign for the hex code value. And then we'll put our hex code value followed by a semicolon. Now you know how to change the color and boldness of words with CSS. Next, let's change the font family to Helvetica. To do that, we'll just add a property of font family, then a colon, and then the value of Helvetica, followed by a semicolon. And now we've successfully updated our font family. Finally, we want to update our font size. And to do that, we'll just add one more property of font size, then a colon, then our value as a number with a px after it. And the px here stands for pixels. So you may be wondering, what is a pixel? Well, a pixel here generally refers to about one pixel on your computer screen. But this is not always the case since different screens have different pixel resolutions. And that's a wrap. In this lesson, you've learned a ton of what CSS is and how it can be used to change the style of text on your web page. Great job. Hi, and welcome to the second lesson in this CSS course. In this lesson, we'll be going over a few different topics like adding height and width to elements, along with background colors and borders. We're going to start out with a div element, and inside of the div, I'll simply type the word square. And now let's actually make this div a square. And to do that, we'll again be using the style attribute to style this HTML element. We'll first give it a height of 400 pixels and a width also of 400 pixels. So for a height, we can use whatever number we want here, as in 0 to whatever. Uh, and as far as units, we're using pixels, but we can also use percentages. The percentage here would relate to the parent container of the element. So for example, if you have a div that is the only div on your page, 
and then you give that div a width of 100%, then it should be as wide as the entire page. And to use percentage unit instead of pixels, we'll just type a percent sign instead of the px. But looking back at our div, we just created a square, but you can't really tell yet. So let's add a border to this div so we can tell where the edges are. And the border property is simply border, followed by a colon, and then the value. So the value for the border property actually takes three different parts. And the first part is the width of the border, and we'll make our border two pixels wide. Then the next part is the pattern that you want to use for the border. Our pattern is going to be solid. Uh, other options are dashed, uh, and I actually don't know the other ones. I usually just use solid. And so we'll type solid here without quotes. And the last part of the border value is going to be the color of our border. And we'll use blue. So now we type blue here without any quotes. And then we finish with a semicolon. And you can also target these three different parts of the border value separately if you want to. Uh, if you want to just target the border pattern, you could use border style uh, instead of just border. Um, so you would say border style colon and then solid and then semicolon. Uh, for the border width, you can actually use the property border width as border hyphen width, and then just give it a pixel value if you want. And there's also the border color property, so you can just type border hyphen color and then pass in any color you want. You'll notice that our border has sharp 90 degree edges. And if we want to round off these edges, we have also access to the border radius property. And that's just border hyphen radius colon, and then it takes a value uh, like pixels or percentages. And the higher the pixel here, the more rounded our edges will be. An interesting note here is that if you add a border to a div and then give it a border radius of 50%, then you actually end up with a circle. I've decided that I want the background of my box to be a very light gray to help it stand out from the rest of the page. And that brings us to a new property called background color. That's background hyphen color. And the background color property takes the same values that color does. And I found a nice light gray hex code here. And I'll just add it here and refresh the page. And there we go. Our square is uh, looking better. And that's it for this lesson. Hi, and welcome to lesson three. We're starting this lesson with a simple web page that has two divs on it and each have a border. You can see that we've given each div some text and a gray border. But there's two things that I want to change about these divs right now. The first is that I don't like the text being so close to the edge. So I'd like to create some space there between the text and the edge. The second thing is that I think these divs are a little too close together. I'd like to create some space in between them. Let's start with our first issue. If we want to make some space between the edge of an element and the stuff that's inside of it, we can use the padding property. So let's use the padding property here, and we'll add four pixels of padding to the div on the top. And if we want to add space around an element, we can use the margin property. We'll add 12 pixels of margin to the bottom div. And that's basically it for padding and margin. And you can also target only one side of the element if you want to with padding and margin. And to do that, instead of using the margin property, you could use the margin right, margin left, margin bottom, or margin top properties, depending on which side of the element you want to target. And this is the same syntax for padding as well. You can use padding right, padding left, padding top, or padding bottom. There are even more options for declaring padding and margin in CSS, but I don't want to overwhelm you right now, so I'll save that for another lesson. And that's it. Hi, welcome to lesson four. Up until now, we've been writing all of our CSS inside the style attribute that lives inside the element in our HTML page. This approach to CSS is referred to as inline styling. We're now going to introduce you to a new method that uses style tags and classes along with IDs to style elements. We're about to go over what style tags, IDs, and classes are, but before we do that, I want to describe uh, the styles that we're trying to add first. We're going to start out with two divs on our page, and each contains some text. And what we would like to do is add a rounded border to each of these divs. And to the div on the bottom, we want to add some margin and change the font color to blue. So the first thing that we'll do is make some space at the top of our HTML file and inside of our head tags, we're going to add a style tag. And inside of the style tag, we'll type a dot, then the word rounded border, and then a set of curly braces. 
and just below that we'll type a pound sign, then the word div2, then another set of curly braces. The dot here means that we're planning to target the class of a particular element or elements. And the pound sign here means that we're planning to target an ID of a particular element. So what are classes and what are IDs? That's a good question. So the main difference uh, between classes and IDs are that classes are used um, for multiple elements and they're used to tie those elements to a particular style. And IDs are generally meant for just one particular element. So within a set of curly braces for the rounded border class, we'll add a border and a border radius. And inside of the curly braces for div2, the ID declaration, we'll add some margin and add this cool blue that I found uh, for the font color. So nothing has changed yet, but we're almost done. We just need to connect the elements in the HTML with the class and ID that we mentioned in our style tags. And to do that, we'll add a class attribute to each of the divs that we want to connect with our class styles. And the class attribute will take a class as its value. And since we want both divs to have the rounded border, we'll add the rounded border class to both of our div elements. And finally, we want the second div within our HTML to have the div2 ID on it. So we'll start with ID, uh, then an equal sign without any spaces, then quotation marks, again without any spaces, and we finish up with our value of div2 within those quotation marks. And you can call the div ID here uh, or the class, whatever you want, although there are some special characters that can't be used. For now, just know that you're safe to use letters, numbers, and underscores. But the uh, first character for a class or ID cannot be a number. So now our HTML is connected to those CSS styles that we put within the head tags. And if we refresh our page, we'll see that our styles show up. Pretty cool. But uh, this is actually a little bit of bad practice to have our style tags within our HTML page. What's recommended is to create a whole new file for our CSS, and then we'll reference that file from within our head tags. So to do that, let's rip out our style tags and everything inside of it, and then we'll put them in a new file. We'll save this new file and we'll call it homepage.css. Here, we need to have the .css file extension at the end of this file so that the browser knows that it is in fact reading a CSS file. So in our new CSS file, we don't need these style tags anymore since we're not inside of an HTML page. So we'll go ahead and just delete those. And now we have two files. And in our case, they're both in the same folder, our HTML page and our style sheet. And now we just need to connect these two files somehow. To do that, we'll add a new tag inside of the head tags of our HTML page. And the new tag is called a link tag. This particular tag must be inside the head tags of our HTML page. And this link tag here uh, has a rel attribute on it, and that's R-E-L. And this attribute takes a value of style sheet. But the href attribute here on our link tag is what we're most concerned with. The href attribute for our link tag takes a value that will be the path uh, to our CSS file. And since homepage.css our CSS file is uh, in fact in the same folder as this HTML file, then we'll simply write homepage.css here. And the link tag will look for that CSS file in the same folder. If we refresh our homepage.html page again, everything is working the way that it should be. And now our code is a little bit more organized. Hi, and welcome to the last lesson in this CSS course. In this final lesson, I want to touch on a couple CSS frameworks along with talking about what a framework is exactly, and then speak about something that many frameworks implement that's referred to as a grid system. First, I want to explain what a CSS framework is and how we might use it. A CSS framework is simply CSS code that someone else usually has written and that we can use to accomplish some common CSS tasks. Now let's talk about what a responsive grid is. Uh, let's start by picturing a website for, say, a clothing company. And on a desktop computer, the business owner may want to show four clothing items per row. So if they're showing 12 total items on the home page, then on desktop view, then you'll see three rows of uh, four items stacked one on top of the other. 
But when someone is on a tablet, the business owner might only want to show three items per row. And when the user is visiting the site from a mobile phone, then they only want to show one item per row. So the popular CSS frameworks tend to have built-in solutions for solving this particular problem. These frameworks usually come built in with CSS classes that will target each of those devices separately. And if we're using that framework, all we have to do is place those particular classes within our HTML. Let's see how this might work using a newer CSS framework called Materialize. To use the grid system for this library, we need to start it with a container div. And our container needs to have a class called row on it. And then for each column that we want inside of our row, we need to add the class col, which stands for column. And then you can use the letters S, M, or L, each followed by a number to target different screen sizes. S, M, and L here stand for small, medium, and large, respectively. And generally, large will target desktop computers, medium will target tablets, and small will target mobile phones. And in this case, the materialized framework has split up the page into 12 vertical slices. So in our case, on a small device, each column will be the full width of the screen because the 12 here beside the S indicates that on small screens, the column will take up 12 twelfths essentially of the screen. And also we can see that on large screens, our columns will take up a third of the screen or in other words, four twelfths. So it does take a little bit of math, but you do get the hang of it after a while. There's a lot of other neat things that you can do with materialized CSS and with other frameworks like it, but we won't get into those things right now. Another popular CSS framework that you may have heard of before is called Bootstrap. Now, and if you haven't yet, I hope that you'll continue on to the next track where we dive into the world of JavaScript. Bye. Hi, and welcome to the world of JavaScript. For the next 10 lessons, we'll be going over some fundamental JavaScript basics. This course assumes that you have a basic understanding of HTML and CSS. If you don't, no worries. Just hop over to our CSS or HTML courses first, and then come back here and you'll be ready to go. JavaScript is a language that's primarily used for the web. It can be used for a lot of things, like submitting form data or adding HTML to a web page. And like CSS and HTML, it's built into most modern browsers. So to start coding in JavaScript, all we need is a web browser. So let's get started. In this first lesson, we're gonna go over what a JavaScript variable is. During this course, we're also gonna be using the browser console a bit to write JavaScript code. If we go ahead and open up our browser and then right click on any page, we should be able to see a list sort of like this. And we're looking for the option inspect element. Go ahead and click on that option and you'll be taken to a new window or area in your browser similar to this one. Now let's find a tab or button named console. Once we've clicked on that, we're where we want to be to be able to start writing JavaScript code using our browser. And the steps to find your browser's developer console may be different depending on your browser. So if you do find yourself stuck, please reach out in the Schoolhouse forum and we'll try to get an answer for you as quick as we can. Let's start out by typing some variables. A variable in the context of programming is a character or a group of characters that represent a value that we want to save, like a number or a word, for instance. And that value may change at some point. We store variables in JavaScript by writing let. Um, and this is actually the new way. The old way is var, and then a space, and then a character or group of characters that we want the variable to be named and then an equal sign, followed by the value that we want to save. To create a variable called name that stores somebody's name, you might write this, let name equal John. And if we type this in our dev console, and that's short for developer console, by the way, then uh, we hit enter, we should see John printed to the screen. And for our name variable, we're using the let keyword. And again, the let keyword is the newer and enhanced version of the var keyword. There's a slight difference in the way that they work, but we won't go into that now, and we'll continue to use let instead. But you may see the var keyword in some code here and there, but now you at least know what it means. Now back to our name variable. You'll notice that the value of name here is a name within quotes. This is an example of a string. 
A string is basically just a group of characters. And we'll go over a couple more data types in this lesson. The first we had was a string. Uh, the second is a number, which is simply a positive or negative number, like 4 or negative 234. And the last type we'll cover is a Boolean. There are only two values that a Boolean can have, uh, either true or false. Now let's create a variable of each of those types. Let's start out by creating another name variable, and then we'll set an age variable to 28, and then we'll set a Boolean variable and join JavaScript to true. So here we have a string, a number, and a Boolean, three different data types. Now let's say that Alex just had a birthday, and we want to update the variable storing his age. We can write age equals 29. We don't need to write the let keyword again since we've already initialized the age variable. For different reasons, we may want to create a variable that is not able to change. And we can do that using the const keyword instead of let. Like this. Const, c-o-n-s-t, then a space, then the name of our variable, which in this case is name, then an equal sign, followed by our value. Now, if we want to try to reassign this name variable, we'll get an error. This type of variable is called a constant variable, hence the keyword const. We've certainly covered a lot of ground for our first lessons, and I'll catch you in the next lesson. Bye. Hi, and welcome to the second lesson in this JavaScript course. In this lesson, we're going to learn how to log and alert values from our website, as well as update HTML on a web page with JavaScript. We're going to start with logging. Say that we've built a large group chat website, and one morning when someone tries to send a message on our site, nothing happens. So there's a bug somewhere in our code, and we need to find it and fix it. Often when a developer needs to find a bug in their code, they'll use console.log. Console.log is a function, uh, and a function is basically a piece of code that performs a task or maybe a group of tasks that we can reuse. And the JavaScript language comes with many useful built-in functions that we can use, like console.log. Uh, in this case, console.log will print out code into the developer's console. So if we place this code, console.log, with a set of parentheses, and then we put some text inside, in this case, hello, wherever we put this in our code, whenever the code is run and it hits this spot, then we'll see hello printed in our developer's console. So console.log is really useful for debugging errors we can see the current state of variables uh, and see if they've changed or if they're what we expect. Really helpful for our debugging code. Another way to show a message is with the alert function, and it's used like this. You can see we have alert and then a set of parentheses and then a message inside. The alert message will appear in a pop-up window on a web page instead of the developer console. So alerts are generally used to send messages to the user of a website rather than the developer. Now let's talk about how we can change HTML with JavaScript. Every HTML element on our web page has a built-in property called inner HTML. And the value of this property is basically whatever is inside of the element. So if we want to add HTML inside of an element or replace what's already in there, we first need to get a reference to that element, that is the container. And then we can use the inner HTML property uh, using the reference to that container. If we have placed an ID on our element like this, then we can get a reference to that element by writing this. So in this case, the document is basically uh, a built-in reference to our web page. So any web page you type in document, you'll get a reference to basically the entire page. And this document uh, object has a lot of methods or functions on it that we can use. One of them is get element by ID. And so this is a function um, that we can use to find a reference to elements that we want based on their ID. So in our case, we pass in the ID of our container, and now we have a reference to that element. And now we can update the HTML that's inside of that container by doing this. myContainer.innerHTML equals whatever we want. In our case, hello there. And if we simply want to read what HTML is inside of our element, and we can just type this without the equal sign. 
and this will give us whatever's inside of that container. We just breezed through a bunch of new concepts. If you can't remember what we just covered, don't worry. Hi, welcome back. We're about to go over the JavaScript if-else statement. The if-else statement is a bit of code that's often used in JavaScript. It's used to check if something is true, and then if it is, then we'll do something. And if it's not true, then we'll do something else. And it looks like this. Now let's go over what all this means. For this example, imagine some code that a wholesaler might use to calculate a discount for a particular customer. Now let's break down this code. We type if, then a set of parentheses, then inside the parentheses, we declare a condition. The condition here is anything that evaluates to a Boolean. And if you remember from our first lesson, a Boolean is either true or false. So for the condition, you could write either true or false. But in our case, we want to write an expression that evaluates the true or false. So if items bought equals 400, then the condition here would evaluate to true. And the code inside the curly braces would be run. But if items bought was, say, 200, then the condition would evaluate to false, since 200 is not greater than 300. And the first code block would be skipped, and then the next condition would be checked. So two more things to remember here. Number one, a default case is written by simply typing else without any parentheses and will be run if all the other conditions turn out to be false. And the second thing is that any conditions declared after the first if condition are written as else if instead of just if. You can also check if multiple things are true, like this. Say we only want to offer a discount if items bought is greater than 100, and the customer is also a gold member. To do this, we can use the double ampersand in between the conditions, like this. And finally, we'll learn about the OR operator. The OR operator is written as two pipe characters side by side. And like the AND operator, the pipes are placed in between two conditions. And it's good to mention here that you can have as many conditions as you want, um, as long as they're separated by these AND or OR operators. And there's some other operators that we'll go into later. But in this case, using our OR operator, say we want to give a discount to a customer who's bought more than 300 items or to a customer who is a platinum member we can write an if statement like this. And that's the basics of the if else statement. There are definitely some more details and some more nuances that we'll get into later. Best of luck, and you'll see me in the next lesson where we're gonna go a little bit deeper into functions. Well, bye for now. Hi. Well, do you remember the console log statement and the alert function that we talked about briefly in lesson two? Those were examples of functions built into JavaScript. In this lesson, we're going to talk a little bit more about functions and how we might create some ourselves from scratch. As a recap, a function is basically a piece of code that we can reuse that performs some specific programming task. We're about to create a function here step by step, but before we do, let's do a quick review on variables. Here we have a variable. We type let, then a space, then a character or a group of characters that we want to use as our variable, then an equal sign, followed by the value that we want our variable to have. Here, if we type first name now, we'll see John. Now let's create a last name variable. And we can actually create a string from variables also like this. This syntax is pretty new in JavaScript. It allows you to create a string with variables. Uh, not too long ago, you could do the same thing, but you would have done it a little bit differently like this. The new way helps a lot if you're creating a string with multiple lines, since you used to have to have a plus sign at the end of each new line. And what we're doing here, making strings with variables, this is technically called a template literal. And you can see that instead of quotation marks, we use backticks. And every variable gets surrounded by curly braces with a dollar sign directly to the left 
of the opening curly brace. Template literals work very well with functions since functions often take parameters. And we haven't yet talked about parameters, but function parameters are basically values that a function uses. And these are values that can change, so when we're ready to use our function, we can tell the function what the value is to suit our particular needs. Uh, for example, say you just went on vacation and you set up an email service that auto-replies to people uh, and addresses them by name if they're people who happen to be in your contact list. That service might use this function here, address by name reply. And you can see that this function takes a parameter, which is name, and then it uses that parameter and inserts it uh, and creates this message. So since this function could be used for any of Margaret's contacts, we'll make the name a parameter of the function so that we can simply pass in the correct name when we need to and create a message. Well, that's all for now. Hi, in this lesson, we'll be going over how to get user input from a web page into our JavaScript. Let's say that we have a text box where a user can type their email address. And at some point, we want to get the value of this input, meaning we want to see what the user has typed in the field. Maybe in this case, we want to check that the string that they typed has an at symbol in the correct position so we can know that it's a valid email before we save it. A little review here. To get a reference to an element that's on our web page, such as a text input like this, we can write document.getElementById and then we can pass in the ID that's on that element. And if we want to get the current value of this input, we can simply append value to the end of our document.getElementById function, uh, like this. And if we do this, we'll have the current value of that input. Or if you have a select box with options, you can get the currently selected option by doing the same thing as above. Just get the element by its ID and then append value. And lastly, if we want to get the value of a checkbox, we can write this. So here we're replacing value with checked. And this would return a Boolean value, true or false. So now we know how to get the value of some inputs using JavaScript. But how do we know when to get those values? So now we know how to get the value of some inputs using JavaScript. But how do we know when to get those values? Are we always listening for changes to a text field or a checkbox? The answer is that JavaScript will only be listening for changes to a particular input field when you tell it to listen. And to tell JavaScript to listen for a change to an input, we use something called an event listener. An event listener listens for events that happen on our web page. An event in JavaScript is basically anything that the user can do on your web page. For example, the user moving the mouse on your page, or clicking a button, or submitting a form. Uh, these are all examples of something that will fire an event in JavaScript. And we can listen for each of them. Um, in our case, we want to listen for the event that happens when a text field changes. So to do this, we can use the event listener called input. And this is how we can use it. So what we're doing here, first we get a reference to our input by using get element by ID, and then we can use that reference, in this case it's my underscore input, and we do dot add event listener, and then it takes two parameters. The first parameter is the listener that we want to use, in our case the input listener, and the second parameter is a function. So now you know that functions can take functions as parameters. Pretty interesting. And the first parameter of add event listener says what to listen for, and the second parameter here says what to do when it finally hears something. In our case, if our input changes, we want to alert that change in a pop-up window. So you'll see a pop-up window, and whatever the user typed in that input box will show up in that window. And that's it for this lesson. Hi, welcome to lesson six. Here we're going to talk about arrays. This is an array in JavaScript. 
So arrays are a type of list, and they can hold any data type in JavaScript, like numbers, or strings, or functions, or a mix of all of them together. For now, let's make a list of fruits using an array. To make an array in JavaScript, we type an opening square bracket, then a value or values, each separated by a comma, and then we end with a closing square bracket. And arrays are indexed, and this means that each item in a JavaScript array has an associated number that goes in order starting at zero. And you don't see this number, but this number is used to get access to the item uh, at that particular position. So if we have an array called fruits, like this, we can get the first item in this list by typing fruits, followed by a set of brackets with no spaces, and then inside of the brackets, we can type the position that we want to access. So the first item in the fruits array would be zero, since our array positions start at zero. And if we want to get the second item, we could type here fruits, a set of brackets, and then place a one in between the brackets, and so on. Now let's learn how to add items to an array. To do that, we're going to use a built-in function made specifically for arrays called push. And this is how we use it. To add items to our fruits array, we simply type fruits, then a dot, and then push, followed by parentheses. And inside of the parentheses here, we'll type the value that we want to add to the array, like this. And finally, let's learn how to get the length of an array. The length is just the number of items that are in that array. And to do that, we'll type our array name. In our case, it's fruits. Then we'll type a dot followed by length. And that's it. This will give us the total items in our array. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. And I will catch you in the next lesson. Hi, welcome back. Here in lesson seven, we're gonna talk about the JavaScript for loop, which looks like this. Now there's a lot going on here, so let's break it down piece by piece. The point of a for loop in JavaScript is to repeat the code inside the curly braces a certain number of times. And that number of times will be determined by what's inside of the parentheses here. And within the parentheses, we have three different parts. These parts are separated from each other by a semicolon. Now let's go over what each part is doing. The first part here is the initial value. The second part is a Boolean expression. So this will evaluate to either true or false. And this last part is an update that is made during each loop. How many times the loop will run depends on how long this middle part remains true. This is why the update section at the end is so important, because this is how we can make sure that the middle part eventually will become false. If the second parameter never becomes false, we'll just keep looping and looping, and this is called an infinite loop. Sounds pretty intense, but if you find that you've created an infinite loop in your code, the browser will basically start working really hard until it freezes up. So you may just have to restart your browser. Now let's look at an example using a for loop with an array. Let's start by assigning an array of fruits to the variable called fruits. And then in our for loop, our middle value is currently true since i equals zero and the length of our array is four. Now let's go over this i plus plus thing that we see within our parentheses here at the end. This is simply a JavaScript shorthand for adding one to a variable. So for example, if i equals zero, then i plus plus would be the same as saying that the variable i equals zero plus one, which is one. During each loop, i will get one added to it. So the loop will run a total here of four times. Since on the fifth loop, i will equal four and four is not less than four, which is the length of the fruits array. And since the middle part will then evaluate the false, the loop will stop running. We've now reached the end of this lesson and we've covered a lot. For loops can be a bit daunting when we see them at first, but don't worry, the more you're exposed to the code, the sooner it will become clear. And I will see you in the next lesson, bye. Hi, and welcome to lesson eight. In this lesson, we're gonna learn about JavaScript objects. In lesson six, we learned about arrays. 
And arrays can be great for making lists of some kind of data that doesn't really change or that we don't need to know much about. But objects are more complicated values that we want to know a little bit more about. Say you're working at Facebook and you are part of a team that manages all the user's profile data. You might at some point need to pass around that data in JavaScript. And if we all were just using arrays, like a list of first names or a list of users' email addresses, it could be really hard to connect the right username with the right address. Well, let's take a look at this. So this is an example of a JavaScript object. And this is kind of like an array, but instead of a single item and then a comma, objects take two items and then a comma. In objects, the item on the left is called a key, and the item on the right is called a value. You'll also notice that we use curly braces for objects instead of brackets. So an object is basically another kind of a list, but each item in that list has a named key. And similar to a key to a door, uh, we can use that object key to access the value that we want to. So if I have an object named David, and it looks like this, has a first name, key, a last name key, and an email key, then I can get David's email address by simply typing david.email. And there's one more way to get an object value using a key that we should mention here. And it kind of looks like how we get values from an array. We'll type the name of our object, in our case, David. Then we'll type a set of square brackets. And then inside of the square brackets, we'll type the name of the key that we want to use surrounded by quotes. And we only surround our key with quotes when we're using the square bracket syntax here. Objects can get complicated because you can nest them, as in object values can be objects and so on. But we won't get into that just yet. The last thing that I'll mention in this lesson is something called JSON. This is a common term that you may have heard of. It's an acronym that stands for JavaScript Object Notation, which is basically another name for JavaScript objects. And that's it for this lesson. Objects are powerful tools used often in JavaScript programming. And have fun, and bye for now. Hi, and welcome to lesson nine, where we will be talking about how to iterate over objects using the for in loop. In lesson seven, we use the for loop to loop over arrays. It's harder to loop over objects with a for loop since you need to access each object by its key and not by a number. The for in loop is much better suited to work with objects. Here's an example of using a for in loop to log the values of a particular object. We start the loop by typing for and then a set of parentheses, and inside of the parentheses, we set a variable to represent each key inside of our object. In our case, we chose to use item, but we can use most anything we want here. Then after the variable, we type the word in, followed by a space, and then finally the name of our object. Now, inside of our code block, we can reference each of our keys by using our variable item. One thing to note is that we can't use the dot notation here for accessing our object values because our item variable is just a string. So this, inside of our loop, would equal something like this. And since this is not valid JavaScript, we have to use the bracket syntax. And this will turn into something uh, like this within our loop, which is valid. This is complicated stuff, but it will sink in with practice. And I will catch you in the next lesson. Bye for now. Hi, and welcome to the final JavaScript lesson in this course. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about JavaScript libraries and frameworks. A JavaScript library generally refers to a collection of useful code that usually some other group has written that we can use to make our web development easier. jQuery is a great example of a JavaScript library. It's been around for a while and it is still quite popular. jQuery offers us functions to help us easily get references to elements on our page. And among other things, it also comes with functions that can hide, show, or toggle elements on our page. Lodash is another JavaScript library that is useful for working with arrays, objects, numbers, and strings. 
It provides handy functions for the grouping and sorting of arrays and objects. Now let's talk about what a JavaScript framework is and the difference between a framework and a library. A framework in JavaScript is like a library in the sense that it's a collection of useful code, but a framework aims to assist us in more of the overall architecture of our application, whereas a library tends to focus on helping us complete smaller individual tasks. A framework and a library can certainly overlap in their purpose and debates will arise from time to time whether some particular group of code happens to be a framework or a library. AngularJS is a good example of a JavaScript framework, and most would agree on that. Among other things, Angular is great for breaking up our HTML into reusable components. AngularJS was originally introduced by an individual named Mishko Hevri back in 2009 and has since become a very popular open source code project. Open source uh, generally means that the code is free to use and that anyone, even you or I, may contribute to that code. And that brings us to the end of this lesson and to the end of this JavaScript course. Congratulations on making it all the way through. You've certainly learned a ton. And I'll catch you later. Bye.